Thank you, John. It's, uh, it's never a good position to be in between an audience and their lunch, but uh, I thank you for uh, sticking it out. And it is clear by the size of the audience here compared to last year that there's a rising tide of interest in orphan diseases. And that's not just because of the scientific advances that now make it possible to treat these diseases. It's also because the business proposition is well validated at this point. And we've heard a lot about some of the regulatory protections, assistance, exclusivity, the opportunity for chronic dosing, and premium pricing. And those are just a few of the market advantages. And yet, despite these market advantages, orphan markets are not simple. They can be very complex and difficult to quantify the value of. And there's low diagnostic acuity, low disease awareness, there's lack of natural history data, which we just heard about, and very often little in the epidemiology department. So David and I are going to introduce a framework to try to quantify that complexity. And in the process, maybe introduce some quality and clarity in the development decision-making process. And you know, we kind of think about this as something that you can use in the same way that a target product profile is used, only from a more quantitative and commercial perspective. You might want to just take a seat so we can look at the sides. So uh, there may be some of you in the audience thinking, well, why does size matter? Uh, after all, if you get the orphan designation, won't all the drugs approved with an orphan designation have the same protections under the law? And the answer is, of course, yes. And maybe I could have my first slide. Well, it's right here, so one can just take the bull by the horns and draw it up oneself. So there we go. Uh, and in fact, there are some of those important market attributes, price being one well-worn example, that have a very clear correlation with market size, in this case, patient prevalence. And you could also ask, what makes assessing an orphan market so challenging? I mean, after all, you just approach it the same way as you would any disease market. You need to understand the disease and the natural history. You want to be able to quantify and understand your treatment effects. And you need to have an understanding of the underlying patient population or size. And all of these things together will help you determine your eventual market size. The problem with orphan markets is that you cannot call IMS. There's no data monitor reports, uh, probably, in your orphan very rare disease. And uh, there's often not even an ICD-9 code, and ICD-9 unfortunately is still forms the preponderance of data that's available in claims databases and other databases. So it's not until we get to ICD-10 that we'll be able to track some of these rare diseases more carefully. Therefore, you really have to build this data from the ground up. So let's take natural history. It was an excellent overview from Dr. Perizer about the risks, rewards, and importance of establishing natural history data in rare diseases. And yet, for most orphan diseases that I've been a part of and I've been associated with, this is the amount of natural history data that's available. There's just nothing there. And so, you know, and when you start to pick up the bits and pieces from the literature in the key opinion leaders, you often get the feeling like there are five blind men feeling the elephant. And key opinion leader number one may have spent 20 years amassing functional deficit data in a patient population, and key opinion leader number two has reams and reams of kidney ultrasounds. And as those two physicians lay down tracks in the literature, what you get in the literature is a collection of sometimes disparate, sometimes parallel views of the disease, but it's always something that is more narrow than the disease itself. And so, like Dr. Perizer said, you've got to go directly to the patient and ask the patient and corporate regulators in the audience, you need to make sure there's, an, there's some function within your organization that is allowed to talk directly to patients. They will not bite you. In hypo, hypophosphatasia, we were really fortunate that there was an international chat room available and in a, a totally transparent way, I went to them, uh, to the organizers and I asked if I could listen in, eavesdrop, so I could learn more about the disease in an effort to help our clinical development program at Anobia. And I was just stunned by the number and kind of symptoms that these patients experienced and the challenges they faced that was nowhere in the literature. And about one of three, when I went back to check you know, this new 
possible information with the key opinion leaders, I would say about one in three uh, were allowed as maybe, maybe being associated with this disease. So listen to the patients. Secondly, the information you're going to get is qualitative. They're going to be signals, and that's okay. It, it's, it's unlikely you're going to know, you're going to be able to figure out what percentage of Wilson's disease patients present with neurologic symptoms. But you can begin to hear and feel when those symptoms begin to appear. When do they become debilitating? When does mortality start, if that's an aspect to the disease? And when is death and all but certainty? And those inflections are incredibly important quantitative data inputs to the framework. Turning our attention to treatment effects. This arguably should be the easiest part of forming an orphan market assessment, and yet we, we do struggle with this one as well. And it's because, uh, as Anne was talking about, there's no precedence for many of these diseases. So we start again always with the patients themselves with the disease and the medical need that they have. And obviously we need to understand the very specific symptoms or set of symptoms that these patients experience. And the severity or the degree of need, and sometimes there's staging or classification systems that have been applied, uh, and those are, that's the way that the disease is is measured. Uh, just as a side note, some of those classification systems can be extremely unhelpful when it comes to forming a clinical development plan and a regulatory strategy because it may salami slice a disease that is a spectrum with the same uh, uh, underlying pathophysiology of the disease. And then the distribution of the patients with regards to the symptoms they have and the severity over that patient population. Now you overlay that with your treatment effect. And obviously the regulators will look at the patients that you studied in your clinical program, and they're gonna be very focused on the specific symptoms that your treatment ameliorated. And so it's all well and good if an enzyme replacement therapy clears all the glycogen from all the lysosomes in muscle cells. But if there's an underlying motor neuron deficit that is not addressed, then there's gonna be a cache of patients that are not addressed by that therapy. And one also needs to understand the magnitude of effect. It needs to be able to uh, match the severity of the disease and in some cases match it quickly enough that these patients can be rescued. So where these two spheres overlap, that's called your treatment eligible population. And you know, we're simplifying this. Obviously they have to live within a geography where healthcare is available to them. Now even in orphan, in the orphan space, we can't get lulled into an exclusivity mindset. There's always a treatment landscape to consider and you know, there are orphan diseases now that are actually very competitive, PAH being one, but even with a disease as rare as cryoponic associated periodic syndrome, which has an incidence of one in a million, there are two approved drugs for, for CAPS. So you need to understand the other pharmacologic interventions and also the non-pharmacologic interventions. I think that in many diseases there may be a well-defined standard of care like transplant or transfusion and one really needs to understand how physicians uh, plan to use those in the future. Now I'm not going to go into all of the market forecast curves that need to be applied. Um, there are good people in your organizations that know how to do this very well, but diagnostic rates, treatment rates, reimbursement rates, all of which are going to vary by country. Uh, and compliance rates are important to consider. And just one note about diagnostic rates. For rare diseases without a direct treatment available, these will vary and increase considerably over time after there's a launch of a direct treatment. So finally, we turn our, our attention to market size. And I always say there are three legs to the stool of developing a robust market size assessment for a rare disease, epidemiology, there's market research and patient and physician lists. And all three of these are necessary to have a very robust assessment. So epi is great if it's available. It's not always available. One needs to consider the limitations, the methodology that was used, particularly if there's a genotype kind of study looking at mutations, the, the frequency of mutations. And if you apply a straight prevalence or incidence number, I mean, we all know this, you're gonna way overestimate the size of the population. On the other hand, market research is another good source of objective data. But because these diseases are so rare, you may have to go out to a far broader uh, number of physicians and type of physicians 
than you had planned in, in order to get enough of a, a treatment experience to be representative. And just based on that limitation alone, these kinds of studies almost always underestimate the size of a population. And finally, patient and physician lists are incredibly good sources of data. They generally document real, live, or at one time they were living patients diagnosed with a disease. Now, they're not always available. There are real and important privacy and HIPAA concerns around those lists. But used properly, they can be a very important accelerator in your clinical development program. And because these are such an underestimate, these lists really form the sub-basement floor of your patient population estimate. So market research, treatment effect, and market size, uh, rather natural history, uh, those are the three major components of inputs that go into the quantitative framework. And now David is going to take us through that framework. Thank you, Julie. So, um, so what is that framework? Well, in practice, it's a model. Um, in fact, a few separate models that function together as something we like to call a supermodel. It's the physical container for that framework. Those three aspects that we keep talking about, uh, natural history, treatment effect, and market size, live in here. Every non-trivial assumption should be visible and able to be pressure tested with alternatives. Um, the supermodel can help drive decisions. Uh, for example, your business plan, your pricing strategy, your product presentation, and so on. By making your assumptions visible, it helps you understand what data you still need to gather to plug holes in those assumptions so your market forecast becomes reliable and defensible. Um, first, I'll outline the supermodel's contents. Um, excuse me. And then I'll give two short examples of how a supermodel has had a big impact. Uh, the first piece is the epidemiology. This is all about the fundamental disease state, and I want to point out two things here. First, this is where the market size is born, because this is where the incidence assumptions go, um, and the natural history appears here in the form of the survival curves. The uh, second thing is that what makes it super, that is part of a supermodel, is the level of detail. It should be country-specific and multi-year. The, uh, the next piece is the market, and this is where the patients interact with your product. This is the population that you can affect, for example, by increasing disease awareness and so on. Um, structurally, this piece should also be at the country level. Um, that helps you, that can help you rather define your business plan, and this can also help guide clinical trial recruiting if you have that level of detail. Um, those two modules have allowed us to define the market size in terms of patient counts. The last piece, the financials, is what a lot of people recognize as a model. Um, this should be granular enough to help you plan your pricing strategy, your product presentation, uh, possibly even your sales force allocation, and so on. Uh, to do this, you may need very detailed patient characteristics in order to allow you to forecast demand at the unit level. Unit level demand lets you forecast unit level revenue, and that can be key for a pricing strategy. Uh, so now I'd like to tell you all about two examples. The first was how a supermodel guided decisions about product presentation. Um, one client with a biologic had already optimized COGS through manufacturing improvements, and they wanted, to, uh, they wanted to further minimize COGS by selecting an appropriate product presentation. Um, their product is available in single-use vials of different sizes, and dosage is weight-based with leftover vial contents discarded after each use. So uh, we used the supermodel to test tens of thousands of different vial sizes to decide on the optimal set of vials to manufacture. And when the client actually changed their dosage requirements later based on new clinical information, we already had a tool that automated most of that decision process so the client was able to select a new set of vial sizes within days. The, uh, the next example is uh, a case when a, a client used a supermodel to redefine their market size. This was an early stage company. They were trying to define their total market potential for a disease where prevalence was known to vary by country. Uh, the innovation here was to input all of the available epidemiology data, along with some outside market research, into a single model. Um, and this allowed them to define the treatable population with far more precision than anyone else in the space had done. The, uh, the outcome was that we found that the market estimate actually quadrupled using the more precise methodology. And also due to the quality of the model, the client was actually able to take control of the market size conversation. Oops, examples. So as you guys could probably tell from the previous slides, supermodels need lots of inputs. And some of these can get tricky. 
Um, incidence versus prevalence, I know this sounds very simple, uh, but sometimes even published papers confuse those terms or use phrases like birth prevalence, which is really just incidence, and then they shorten that to prevalence, which is really just misleading. Um, it actually does happen, I've, I've seen it before. Uh, studies, oh actually, live birth incidents. Live birth incidents versus annual incidents. The term live births is often used for, uh, for genetic diseases and refers to people born with a disease genotype in a single year, regardless of whether or not they have symptoms at birth. Um, the term annual incidence is preferred for diseases like cancer, and in those cases, it's almost synonymous with newly diagnosed cases. Um, studies, uh, studies based on genotype versus those based on phenotype, they have to be used a bit differently. This is actually fairly simple. Genotype studies can undercount patients if all the mutations that cause a disease are not yet known. Uh, on the other hand, they can overestimate prevalence if they include genotypes that never present as uh, clinical phenotypes in the real world. Uh, phenotype studies avoid these problems, but they tend to undercount patients who have not yet been diagnosed. Market research. So market research has lots of foibles. It's probably the most complex thing that you'll have to deal with when it comes to extrapolation. Um, if you field patient surveys in multiple markets, consistency is key. But this is difficult because your initial surveys will be learning experiences. I highly recommend fielding those initial surveys to just a small group of physicians and then budgeting for a larger follow-up sample with an improved survey instrument at a later time in the same market. Geographical differences. Uh, this simply means be careful when dealing with different healthcare sim uh, systems. As I'm sure many of you know, um, particularly in Europe, centers of excellence are often where rare diseases are treated. Um, if your survey misses these centers, then you will miss big reservoirs of patients. On the other hand, if a physician from one of these centers happens to fill out your survey, then of course you shouldn't assume that, uh, that all physicians in, the same market, in that market rather, have the same high density of patients as that kind of physician. So when I started talking, I mentioned that a supermodel is a tool for making your assumptions explicit and thereby pointing out where they need to be confirmed or improved. So as you develop your product, you'll refine those values and narrow the range of possibilities. Some of the most important drivers for that process are shown here. Um, payers. Payers want to cover as few affected lives as possible. So for their purposes, they need an estimate that is a ceiling, not a floor. The best evidence of this is an actual insurance claims database search because this will uh, count the number of patients who really do have the disease. The problem, of course, is that in the real world, this almost never works because rare diseases rarely have codes for diagnosis or procedures. Uh, thus far, this lack of evidence hasn't been a huge problem, particularly for ultra-orphan drugs in the U.S. It's not so much the case elsewhere, and even in the U.S., this is, of course, subject to change in the future. Patient segmentation fits nicely into this refinement process. You can segment your patients by disease severity and treatment eligibility. Uh, this lets you have internal conversations around product presentation and pricing strategy, and those tend to arise closer to launch. Deciding on your geographical reach, this, uh, this simply means that you refine your uptake curves by country so that you can decide where to expend your sales and marketing effort. Uh, of course, everyone wants to reach the big five European countries, but should you have an organization in, say, the top nine countries, or can you reach enough patients with just seven countries? I've saved, I've saved the best point here for last. One of the most productive things you can do, at least from a modeling perspective, is to resolve the inevitable differences between the published epidemiology literature and your own internal market research. Um, let me give you an example. Let's say there's a prevalence study um, in a minor market like Australia, and that's where your prevalence data come from. And of course, you've fielded your surveys in major markets, and let's say that you've happened to find far fewer patients in those uh, major market surveys than were predicted by that Australian study. What you could do is field a small survey in Australia, which could indicate whether that, um, that prevalence paper was an overestimate, or whether there is genuinely high prevalence in Australia, or whether your surveys, your major market surveys, undercounted patients, perhaps due to uh, undiagnosed cases, in which case those undiagnosed patients could be counted towards your market potential. So, well, that is the short and very simple version of this framework. Um, in practice, it's an iterative process that develops as your product develops. Um, but uh, rather than dive into more details, we'd like to uh, pause here and not delay lunch too much further and uh, answer any questions that you all may have.